Hello, and thank you for watching. You are watching my lecture, Professor Ryan Paul from a and University, Kingsville, on Ovid's Metamorphosis, Book 3. Book 3, which our translator calls The Wrath of Juno, as uh, pretty much every story has something to do with or is spurred from Juno's wrath, her anger. Um, so we begin with just the end of the story about Jove in Europa. We'd last seen him um, carrying her off into the waves, and now um, he has his way with her on the island of Crete, and his, her father orders her brother Cadmus to find her or face banishment. Seems rather unreasonable, and the narrator agrees. Of Jove, the narrator tells us, and now his taurine imitation ended, the god exposed himself for what he was to cowed Europa on the Isle of Crete. You might get the pun there, she's been cowed uh, since he was a bull. <clears throat> and then about Cadmus and his father, in an action both paternal and perverse, the captured maiden's baffled father bids her brother Cadmus to locate the girl or face an endless term of banishment. And this leads us into the story of the founding of the great city of Thebes, the, Thebes, the legendary city of ancient Greece. So Cadmus sees, uh, goes to see the oracle of Phoebus and is told that he will colonize a new land. And in order to find this land, he has to find a cow, a heifer, one that has never worked before, one that has never labored, and follow that heifer um, to this new land. So he's told, you will meet a heifer in a trackless place who has not borne the yoke nor broken up the earth with a curved plow. And this comes true, so Cadmus follows it and comes to the new land where he decides this is where we will found our, our new city um, and we must, of course, make the proper sacrifices to Jove and the other gods. Now he sends his soldiers off to gather supplies for their sacrifice, but they're killed by a great serpent that is dedicated to the god Mars. Um, Cadmus goes out looking for them, and when he finds them, uh, engages the serpent in battle, and as a good hero should, kills it. And so it's this killing of the serpent that is kind of the founding myth of Thebes. Here's a couple of excerpts from the description of the serpent, which um, might remind us of things we've read in previous myths, Iliad or the Odyssey or other ancient Greek myths. It also uh, is something that would be adapted later by uh, writers such as Spencer and Milton in the Middle Ages, or excuse me, in the uh, uh, Renaissance and other writers later as well. So a description of the serpent, twisting his scaly coils in rolling knots, with a great, great leap, he flexes like a bow. Those who escape his fangs live but to die, crushed in his coils or poisoned by his breath. On the other hand, we see the hero, um, and it's, a, of course, a very typical heroic action that we see Cadmus modeling, um, and we see uh, many other heroes in, in stories both before and after engaging in the same sort of behavior. Soon at the grove, he sees their broken bodies and towering above them, sways their huge enemy, triumphant, his bloody tongue licking at their sad wounds. The hero cries, most faithful souls, I will avenge your deaths or else I'll join you. And so of course he engages in this long battle and kills the serpent. And after he has killed her, the serpent, then Athena comes down and tells him that she has been helping him, and she gives him advice, says, bury the viper's teeth, because he doesn't know where he's going to get any other soldiers from. Um, and the teeth, once he buries them, grow up into fully armored, fully grown men, and they begin to engage in battle amongst themselves. They winnow themselves down until there's five left, and those five become Cadmus's companions and the, I guess you might say, the fathers of Thebes. I just wanted to uh, highlight this description of the soldiers rising from the earth that uh, it's, it appeals to, gives us a little insight into the lives of the Romans uh, around at the time when Ovid was writing this says it's no different from what you will have seen on feast days in the theater 
when the curtain lifts from the pit and the images of men painted upon it seem to rise heads first and then the rest of them little by little so if you imagine a, a, a curtain that has images of men uh, painted on it and it's at first just all bundled down on the ground and then as it rises up you see first the tops of the soldiers and then more and more as the curtain extends upward um, so it's just an interesting little insight that he compares it to this image that they would have been familiar with going to the theater on feast days where they would have celebrated stories just like the ones that we're reading in uh, these poems. And now we get to the very famous story of Acteon and Diana. Um, the narrator tells us, well, you might say that Cadmus is lucky for everything that he had, the city, his wife, etc., etc., uh, but we shouldn't make judgments about just how happy someone is. But fortunate, a judgment best reserved for a man's last day. Call no one blessed until he dies, and the last rites are said for him. So in other words, anything can happen, the wheel of fortune, uh, can turn and one who is at the height of luxury and, and luck and everything or everything's going your way the next moment everything could come crashing down uh, which is exactly what we see in so many of these stories in this poem and in other Greek myths and Greek plays and, and Roman plays so why is Cadmus not quite so fortunate well um, his great despair over the fate of his grandson Acteon and as the narrator tells us uh, poor Acteon was punished for no reason uh, of his own you'll find if you look closely that the fault here was with fortune not with the young man for can it really be a crime to err uh, can it really be a crime to err to, to make a mistake the narrator asks us uh, and it seems that that's all Acteon did was make a mistake, make a make a, a harmless error, not do anything wrong or bad. So we learn that there's a beautiful grotto called Gargaphy, and that is where Diana and her nymphs love to bathe after they've been hunting. Uh, meanwhile, near there, uh, Acteon, a, a young hunter, nobleman, is lounging around with his friends and he accidentally wanders into this grotto uh, where Diana is bathing. A wonderful description of the grotto here. There's a grove of pine and cypresses known as Gargaphy, a hidden place most sacred to the celibate Diana, and deep in its recesses is a grotto artlessly fabricated by the genius of nature, which, in imitating art, had shaped a natural organic arch. So this art, which is artless, it's nature imitating art, which of course art is an imitation of nature. So it's this multiple levels of imitation and art without art uh, and beauty, just natural beauty that has been shaped somehow at, at the same time. So kind of paradoxical, it's, a, it's an unimaginable, we might say, beauty. We can't really conceive of how this could be both art and artless and natural. Uh, and that is perhaps part of what happens to Acteon himself, that he's in a place that is forbidden, that is unimaginable, seeing something that is unimaginable. And while a Diana bathes as usual, see where Acteon on a holiday, wandering clueless through the unfamiliar forest, now finds his way into her grove, for so fate had arranged, poor Acteon. And of course, uh, stumbling upon Diana when she does not want to be seen is not going to turn out well for him. So Diana is irate at his approach. She splashes water on him and this transforms him into a stag. And unable to speak or otherwise identify himself, he is chased through the forest by his own hounds and they rip him apart. He dies this painful death being torn apart by his hounds. And this has become became an extremely important and popular and famous story um, in the Renaissance, in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, as an allegory of love and desire and how one's own emotions tear you apart when your desire is excited for something that you can't have. Um, that was one of the many ways in which this story was interpreted. And here's part of the description of Diana cursing him. She managed to turn sideways and look back as if she wished she had her arrows handy. 
but making do with what she had, scooped up water and flung it in Acteon's face, sprinkling his hair with the avenging droplets, and adding words that prophesied his doom. Now you may tell of how you saw me naked. Tell it if you can, you may. So that challenge that he's not going to be able to speak about this is one of the things that's very important about the story as it uh, later became interpreted. That it's a loss of speech in part is what happens to Acteon upon seeing um, this unattainable desire, the goddess of chastity, nude. Poor me, he tried to say, but no words came, only a groaning sound by which he learned that groaning now was speech. He flees the hunt he has so often led, longing to cry out to the pack behind him. It's me, Acteon, recognize your master. But the words betray him, and the air resounds with baying. So again, that image of the loss of voice, the fact that he can no longer speak as a human, he can no longer command with his voice what he commanded before. He's just an animal now, and that's what he's been reduced to by Diana. So we learn that there's a number of different opinions about this uh, action of Diana's, and Juno, however, doesn't, doesn't express an opinion. But she doesn't express an opinion about something else, that Semele, which is a daughter of Cadmus, has been impregnated by who? Well, of course, her husband and brother, Jove. And she's very angry about this dalliance. She's jealous that Semele is pregnant and she is not, um, and she wants to do something. She, she says that she deserves to, she should do something because she deserves better as Jove's queen and sister. Well, at least his sister, as she sort of mockingly says. So part of her plan is she disguises herself as Semele's nurse and goes to visit the young woman. In her disguise, Juno tells uh, the young woman that seducers often claim to be gods when really they're not. They're just trying to seduce these beautiful young women. So she needs to test this man and see if he really is Jove. And the way to do that is to ask him to embrace you in his full glory. Let, him see, let you see all of him, all of his beauty and power, um, just as his wife does when they make love. And she, of course, knows that the, that the woman, being mortal, will not be able to bear witness, will not be able to take the immensity of Jove's glory. So we get another uh, occasion of someone uh, asking for a gift and the god making a promise saying, I swear by the river Styx, which is, of course, the river that they use for their oaths, I will give you whatever you want. She promises Semele any gift that she wishes. And, of course, to his immediate regret, regret, she asks to see him in his true appearance when they make love. And he immediately wishes that he hadn't made this offer. And here is her request. Just as you are when Lady Juno received you in her embraces, and you initiate the pact of Venus, hidden from all, lover, all others, come likewise unto me. Even as she spoke, the god would have prevented her from speaking. So another, this theme of, of uh, making a promise and then the, the uh, gift that's asked for being destructive to the receiver, to the recipient, and uh, the person giving the gift being forced to give this destructive gift to someone even though they don't want to because they've made an oath. A rather grand irony um, in multiple ways. So Jove uh, prepares himself, and he even tries to, to lighten his glory in a little bit, um, to, to mitigate it somewhat, somewhat, but it's still too great, and she is incinerated when he comes to embrace her. Um, he is distraught by this, but manages to save her unborn child, sews it into his own thigh, and carries it to term, and then gives it to her sister, who raises it. And this is uh, where it's said, and even Ovid himself, the narrator, is a little doubtful, says this, is, this just sounds crazy. That's how Bacchus, the god Bacchus, who is known as the twice-born god, uh, how he was born and why he got that name. 
torn from uh, the womb of his mother and then born out of his father. And here we just have a rather in humorous description of Zeus, excuse me, of Jove attempting to mitigate his appearance before making love to Semele. As best he can, he moderates his force, leaving upon its shelf the thunderbolt. Instead, he picks a bolt the Cyclops forged, one with reduced anger and a lower flame. They call such weapons his light artillery. Um, I don't know if that's the translator being humorous or, or how much of that is Ovid, um, but it's, a, it's an amusing um, anecdote, uh, given that we know, of course, she's going to be destroyed. There's a little bit of humor, perhaps, in the, in the setup to the scene. Um, so this idea that he's just carrying his light artillery, even still, it's too much. Meanwhile, we learn that Juno and Jove are having a little chat one day, killing time, and they ask who enjoys sex more, men or women, who gets more pleasure. And Jove says, well, you women get far more pleasure than we men do. And Juno says, no, 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 it's, it's men, they get more pleasure. So they decide, well, we're going to ask the sage Tiresias, uh, because Tiresias has, has the unique experience of having been both male and female. He came upon a pair of snakes making love, uh, I guess if you could call it that, um, and struck them with his stick. And upon doing so, he was magically transformed into a woman. And then seven years later, he came upon the same uh, snakes in the middle of doing their business and struck them again and was magically transformed into a man, uh, back into a man. So Tiresias knows from both sides what sex is like. And Tiresias says women get more pleasure in sex than men. Women experience much more pleasure. And he thinks this is just a silly little joke uh, or a silly little debate game. Of course, Juno is, is not pleased. She's unhappy and she blinds him uh, for this. Jove doesn't want to, apparently can't uh, just contradict his wife, so he says, well, to make up for the blindness, I will give you the power of prophecy. And so Tiresias, who is already a great sage, now becomes as well a great and famous prophet. And the first story he tells um, uh, involves, uh, or the first story involving him, rather, is about the famous Narcissus. So we are told, the first to consult him was Liriope. She asked whether her son, Narcissus, would live to ripe old age. Tiresias responded with these words, if he knows himself, not. That is, he will not live to a ripe old age if he knows himself. And of course, that is the story of Narcissus, that he comes to know and fall in love with himself, which leads to his own death. The first part of the story of Narcissus also involves a, a beautiful young nymph named Echo, who had, was of great speech and she loved to talk and she would always distract Juno. Um, whenever Jove was with one of the other nymphs, Echo would come and talk to Juno and distract her with her speech. So because of this, Juno punished her, took away her ability to speak. So all Echo can do is repeat the last few words that she heard. Um, so, of course, don't mess with Juno is the, is, the, is the lesson that we're learning again and again in this book. And here is that moment of punishment. Once too often has your tongue beguiled me. From now on, you'll have little use for it. And that is why Echo skips now to the end of any speech she hears and then repeats it. So then we're introduced to Narcissus, who is a beautiful young man, and we learn that he's loved by both men and women. They all desire him, but he's too proud. He will not give himself to any. Uh, he thinks he's too beautiful for anyone else, and so disdains all the love offerings of both men and women for him. And Echo sees him and um, uh, even has a little, uh, almost uh, tries to engage him in conversation. Of course, she can't really speak. And he, she even tries to embrace him, but he rejects her and flees from her. So here's my attempt at uh, reproducing what the, their little conversation is like. On the left, we have um, Narcissus's words in black. On the right, Echo's uh, repetitions in blue. Uh, depending how this is translated, um, it's, you know, it's a clever little uh, back and forth. Anyone here? Here. Come, come. Why do you run away from me? Away from me. Here, let us come together. Come together. 
hands off, no hugs. I'll die before you'll have your way with me. Have your way with me. So uh, her repetition is a kind of ironic transformation of everything that um, Narcissus says to her. And in her grief, um, Echo is transformed by the rejection at the hands of the beautiful boy. Spurned, shamefaced, she slipped into the woods and hid herself, living alone in caves from that time on. And yet her love endured, increased even by feeding on her sorrow. Unsleeping grief wasted her sad body, reducing her to dried out skin and bones, then voice and bones only. Her skeleton turned, they say, into stone. Now only voice is left of her on wooded mountainsides, unseen by any, although heard by all, for only the sound that lived in her lives on. So all that's left is this expression of desire, her, her uh, plaintive, pathetic echo of what other people say. That's all that's left of this woman's love and desire for Narcissus. Um, and the image of the grief that doesn't sleep, of course, as she doesn't sleep, wasting her away as she wishes for her lover. Um, it's a very powerful and sad, tragic picture of lost love and how it can be so devastating. And now just on to the story of Narcissus himself, um, we learn that a male admirer of Narcissus prays for him to be punished with unrequited love, just as he has, just as he's suffered because this boy wouldn't give him his love, he wants Narcissus to suffer. And so, thus that leads us to the famous story, Narcissus fleeing from Echo comes upon a pool of water. Worn out and overheated from the chase, here comes the boy, attracted to the pool as to its setting, and reclines beside it. And as he strives to satisfy one thirst, another is born. Drinking, he's overcome by the beauty of the image that he sees. He falls in love with an immaterial hope, a shadow that he wrongly takes for substance. So the irony of trying to satisfy one thirst and, and creating another, an unquenchable thirst, um, he's in love with something that isn't real, his own image, his own reflection, not even in love with himself so much as what he imagines himself to see or what he sees of himself reflected back in, to him from the outside world. Uh, so a hopeless hope, a hopeless love. So, of course, he sees an image of a beautiful boy in the water whom he tries to kiss and embrace, and he can't. And so he complains again and again uh, of the, the pain of unfulfilled desire that he cannot grasp this lover. So now he knows exactly what he's put so many others through, um, the tragic irony of his story. And here we see him uh, looking at the image, transfixed, suspended like a figure carved from marble, he looks down at his own face. He admires all that he's admired for, for it is he that he himself desires all unaware. He praises and is praised, seeks and is the one that he is seeking, kindles the flame and is consumed by it. So the, the it seems, uh, you know, oh, he desires for himself, he praises himself, but it's the does the flame the burning of that flame that consumes him that will lead to his death here we see him attempting to to make love to his image how many times in vain he leans to kiss the pool's deceptive surface or to plunge his arms into the water keen to clasp the next he glimpses but cannot embrace and ignorant ignorant of what it is he looks at he burns for what he sees there all the same aroused by the illusion that deceives him. So even though it's nothing, even though it's a fantasy, he still wants it. He still pursues something that doesn't really even exist. A powerful statement about the way desire works and, and how we can pursue things that in fact are not real, that are just fantasies, projections. We get a rather ironic note here from the narrator who, who uh, interjects a moment to chide Narcissus. Why even try to stay this pans passing fancy? Child, what you seek is nowhere to be found. Your beloved is lost when you avert your eyes. 
that image of an image without substance arrives with you and with you it remains and it will leave when you leave if you can of course the tragedy is that narcissus cannot leave cannot escape the desire for his own image so narcissus finally realizes the truth of what he's staring at uh, but still cannot leave and so wastes away pounds on himself injures himself but ultimately wastes away and dies gazing on his own image and uh, when the nymphs come to bury him they find no sight of his remains just a small flower the narcissus flower Here we get a moving description, a uh, moving account of Narcissus's words as he recognizes the insurmountability, the impossibility of his desire. But now I get it, I am that other one. I've finally seen through my own image. I burn with love for me. The spark I kindle is the torch I carry. Whatever can I do? Oh, would that I were able to secede from my own body, depart from what I love. But now in death, we too will merge as one. So we learn that Tiresias was very famous after the story with Narcissus came out because apparently they all realized he invented or he had uh, predicted it. Um, but King Pentheus of Thebes hates Tiresias, despises him for whatever reason, and uh, constantly mocks him for his blindness. But Tiresias throws this back in his face and foretells that Pentheus um, will wish that he had not seen what he sees, wish that he had been blind um, if he uh, doesn't pay proper respect to Bacchus, because otherwise he will be torn apart. And as we learn in the final story of Book 3, that's exactly what happens to our friend Pentheus. Here's Tiresias' words to Pentheus. Better, far better had it been for you if you too were blind. You would then be spared the sight of Bacchus' rites. The day of his arrival is not distant, this new god who has sprung from Semele, and if you fail to show him fitting honors, the god will tear your mangled corpse to pieces and scatter them. Your blood will stain the trees, will stain your mother and her sisters too. So a rather um, forbidding prophecy, and again, this idea of seeing something you're not supposed to see, uh, and that being destructive, that being dismembering, and the fear of not only will Pentheus be stained with blood, but his mother and sisters will too. As we'll see, it's a rather ironic um, bit of the prophecy that gets fulfilled in an unexpected way. So the new celebrations of Bacchus commence, and these um, the, the Bacchic rites often involved women, and they were these um, sort of uh, uh, orgiastic, ecstatic expressions of drinking and, and absolute, not necessarily debauchery, sexual debauchery, but just sort of partying and wildness. Um, and again, usually often women um, were engaged in these celebrations, so uh, I believe they were controversial in some areas. Um, and they were associated also with a kind of violence. So they commence, and Pentheus is not happy about this. He is angered over the new rites and feels that this is a dishonor to their gods and to the ancestors of Thebes. So here's a description, a little bit of the rites, and perhaps what suggests why Pentheus was so uh, disdainful of them. Liber has come. Liber is another name for Bacchus. The fields reverber reverberate with the ul ululations of the revelers, that is, their songs, their calls. People come pouring from the city's gates, ignoring all distinctions of rank and gender. So the Bacchic rites were this uh, kind of, again, carnival where um, all distinctions of rank were dis discarded for a temporary period while everyone celebrated together. So perhaps that is something that uh, bothers Pentheus as the aristocrat, as the king. And here we have Pentheus disdaining, uh, complaining about the Bacchic rites. Children of Mars, offspring of the serpent, cried Pentheus. What madness clouds your judgment? 
Will these be overcome by women's voices, by wine-soaked madness, drums and debauchery? Thebes has been captured by a sissy boy, untutored in the arts of war, unaided by spears or cavalry, the city taken by slicked and scented hair, by tender garlands, by robes embroidered with rich gold and purple. So he's mad that Thebes, which is descended from these offspring of the serpent, the children of Mars, warriors, has been overcome, um, now being uh, overcome by these celebra celebrations uh, of drinking and debauchery, sexuality, by a bunch of um, what in modern language we might call a bunch of crazy, drugged out hippies. And Pentheus is not happy about that. So Pentheus vows to humiliate Bacchus um, and uh, he sends his slaves out to capture Bacchus so they can't find him, they can't find the god, but they bring back his priest, a man named Ako Akotes, Akoetes or something like that. Uh, not quite sure how to pronounce it. Um, and so uh, Pentheus interrogates this man before he is going to kill him, he says. So uh, the priest tells his story. He said he has been a poor child, uh, born of a humble father. Um, after his father died, he became a sailor so that he wouldn't be stuck in his same small little town. And out once sailing, one of his crew had found a young child. And his fellow sailors thought that they, this was just a, a little child that they could sell into slavery, presumably. But Akotes recognizes that there's something special about this child, recognizes that it's not just a regular uh, human, that it's a god. And of course, as we'll find out, it's the, it's the god Bacchus in the form of a child. And so we get this story where uh, the child had said to, you know, for them to take him to Naxos, and they said, sure, that's where we're going, but in fact they had been going somewhere else, presumably to sell him. Akotes tries to stop them, but they, the other sailors ignore him. Um, ultimately, Bacchus uh, punishes them by stalling their ship in the middle of the ocean and transforming them into animals, um, all except Akotes. And so Akotes is, is struck, was, dumb with fear, but overcomes it, sails to Naxos, and becomes a devoted follower of Bacchus ever since. Pentheus, of course, doesn't care about any of this, and he decides that he's going to torture the priest, but um, before they're able to, the chains, ma chains magically fall away, so presumably the, the priest escapes. So finally, Pentheus decides himself to go and confront the Bacantes, the, the Bontic, uh, Bacchic revelers, and as we might guess, this is not going to turn out well for him. This is when he's going to see what he shouldn't see, the secret rites of the Bacchic revel revelers. No longer sending others, he himself went to Scytheron, the appointed site for the performance of the mysteries, and heard the songs and loud cries of Bacantes. So Pentheus was roused by their wild cries, his wrath rekindled by the savage clamor. And here, as he observed the mysteries with his profaning eyes, the very first to sight him and pursue him in a frenzy, the first to wound him with the hand she hurled, with the wand she hurled, was his own mother. Sisters, she cried, come here, a great boar has blundered into our field, a boar that I must slay. So we have a repetition in some ways of the Acteon myth, but instead of it being the um, uh, forbidden nudity of the goddess of chastity, it's the secret rites of the Bacchic revelers, including his own mother, celebrating this twice-born god that uh, Pentheus sees, and his uh, mother and, and her sisters then mistake him in their, in their reverie, in their in, insane frenzy um, for a, a boar that they have to kill. And so tragically uh, for Pentheus, they tear him apart, and we see the ironic fulfillment of the prophecy that they too, his mother and sisters, would be stained with his blood. And here we get some of the brutal and graphic description of Pentheus's death. Wounded, he cries out, help, Aunt Antonoe, Antonoe. She tears off his right arm, while Ino in rapture savages the left. He has no arms to stretch out to his mother, unlucky man, but cries out, mother, look, and shows her his torso with its missing limbs. Tossing her hair in a frenzy and exulting at the grim sight, Agave tears her son's head from his trunk. So 
the mother and sisters tear the son apart for profaning the mystery of Bacchus. All right, some questions about book three, The Wrath of Juno. Uh, what might be symbolized by the story of the founding of Thebes? That is, of course, it's symbolic of the founding, but the way in which the founding occurs, the situation in which the, sit the city is colonized, um, in particular, that it was founded while searching for a lost woman, a woman who had been uh, kidnapped and, and, in fact, raped. Um, what is significant or meaningful about that as a founding myth, that the city is somehow a response to that um, violation. And what does that say about civilization and human civilization versus the kind of unbridled lust that's represented by the actions of the gods? More questions. Think about the myth of Acteon and Diana as an allegory about love and desire and the forbidden. Um, what does it attempt to capture about the experience of unexpected desire and unrequited sexual desire? What is it telling us about what it feels like to see something and to be suddenly possessed of a desire to want something but to be unable to have it? Why is Diana's nudity both literally and metaphorically dangerous to men? Literally it's dangerous because she's the goddess of chastity, but metaphorically what might that symbolize? Thinking about this from a psychological or psychoanalytic interpretation, if you're familiar with those fields, those discourses, what might be uh, the psychological interpretation, the psychoanalytic interpretation of this story, um, or a psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic interpretation, we should say, because there could be many. Um, and why do you think the story became so popular among later poets? How does it serve as a powerful and in some ways unexpected founding myth for the act of writing poetry itself and love poetry in, from, in particular. Why is it a surprising myth for that action and uh, why is it a powerful myth for that activity? More questions. Think about the story of Narcissus as another allegory about love and desire. Um, again, what could be a psychoanalytic or psychological interpretation of that story? Uh, why is Narcissus uh, unable to free himself from the image of in this, that he sees even after he knows that it's just himself? Why is he still unable to tear himself away from it when he knows it's impossible? And what does that suggest both literally and figuratively about the power of desire? What is it capturing about the experience of wanting something, even something that is known to be a fantasy or impossible? And when we think about narcissism and narcissistic behavior, is it merely just a literal love of oneself? Is the narcissistic person just the person who looks at themselves in the mirror? Or are there other ways that narcissism can manifest? Are there other ways that narcissism can interfere in the relationships between two people or affect how one person sees another? And then just the last couple questions. Why does King Pentheus seem to hate Bacchus so much? Are there any hints or possibilities suggested by the text? What does Bacchus represent and what does Thebes or Pentheus represent and why are they opposed? And thinking about Pentheus' death, what's ironic about it? What's tragic about it, if, if anything? All right, next will be a video on Metamorphosis Book 4 since these lectures on uh, metamorphosis are turning out to be much longer than the earlier ones. Um, the quiz for this week, the first one, is going to be just on books one through three. Um, so I'm going to shorten the quiz. And the uh, quiz for Friday will cover at least through book seven, possibly all the way through book ten, but it might not. Again, because uh, these, these books are uh, filled with a lot more uh, information, a lot more ideas, a lot more material to talk about, I think. So um, if you have any questions, of course, you know how to keep, how to keep in touch with me. Uh, phone, email, text, uh, Blackboard. Otherwise, keep, uh, keep up the good work and continue to change for the better. Have a great week.